two or three months so that Travis can sync the video and the audio together. So old habits die hard. So uh, he said, you might want to do that this morning just to make sure we get in sync. So this doesn't appear once it's on the website like a Japanese movie or something like that. But <laughs> then you hear the sound and, and all that. There has been so much going on behind the scenes. This leadership team, we have, this has been painful working through this, trying to figure out how do we come back together, what is true, what is lies, what, do we, what can we believe, what is actually happening compared to what we're being told is happening, and, and there's just so much, so much information out there, and so much of it just simply cannot be trusted, and so Remember the words of C.S. Lewis. When Travis spoke to us just prior to us going into this lockdown, he shared with us that, that clip that, that C.S. Lewis had written. But the gist of that was, we don't stop living life. I love what Audra said. We're created to be in community. Not to be isolated, not to be separated. We're created to touch. We're created to, to hug. We're created to be together. God has wired us and created us that way. And, and so this has been a long time coming to get us back together. And I am very excited to be here. Again, I want to reiterate the hard work that so many put in just to get us in this building this morning. So many things had to happen. And then we had the curveball thrown in, at us with the flooding of the fellowship hall. So if you smell a musty smell, there's a reason for that. We had a swimming pool, indoor swimming pool, uh, and that we, we had to deal with Friday night. And so we're getting it dried out. I appreciate all of you guys that showed up that night to help us, to bring us fans, uh, to help us to get this dried out. And, and we've got it resolved, but we're dealing with the odor right now, and it's going to take a while to get that done. I would ask you if anybody has one of those ionizing machines or whatever they are, they treat the air or whatever, uh, we could use two or three of those. Uh, to put in that basement, and it will help to, to deal with that odor and stuff this next week. Uh, we don't know exactly what next week's going to look like yet. Uh, we're making a lot of these decisions on the fly, so be in prayer for us and the leadership team as we, we continue to move forward in this. But, man, the music was just awesome this morning, wasn't it? And I'm going to miss. Hey, you guys worship guys, you want to set your chairs up and come up here and sit with me on the stage again? I was starting to get used to that. It was, pretty, it was pretty cool. We had trouble keeping Walter awake while I was preaching, but other than that, everything went really, really well. So uh, Alex was a little difficult to deal with once in a while on the stage, but, but uh, that's all right. I loved interacting. I, uh, gosh, there's so much I want to talk about. There's so much I want to, I want to share with you guys, and, and I know we don't have time because all of you know this message is probably going to last about four hours. So... <laughs> We probably need to get started. See, she already knows this is a two-water bottle sermon. So, uh, but it's good to look at you in the face. Now, we're down, and I understand that. There's, there's, we've got a lot of people that, that still have compromised immune systems, and they've got to be a little more cautious than the rest of us and stuff. So we have to be sensitive to that. What's interesting was the phone calls I got this week. People were aggravated at me. You're opening this week. You're opening this week. We're on vacation. We're leaving town. They've opened up the campgrounds, and we're going to be gone, and we're not going to be able to be there. And so we would probably be 20% fuller if it wasn't for people getting an opportunity to go on vacation. But anyway, we're going to get this thing recorded this morning. We're going to get it on the website just as quickly as we can so that, that everybody in our congregation gets a chance to, to, to be with us again even though it's via video, um, they're going to be able to be with us. I just want to say to those of you who are visitors with us, thank you for coming. Thank you for, for you coming together this morning with us and, and, and being with us. We, we just want you to know you're welcome. It's not a normal setting. Uh, next week, you're going to get coffee and donuts, and, and the coffee help you stay awake during the message. And so, uh, But anyway, we are so thankful that you're here with us too. Fill out a connection card for me. Um, that way I kind of get some information on you. And if you have any questions, please use those connection cards. Okay, what time is it? 11.04. See, I don't have my monitor down here anymore. We've added a screen back there. 
They haven't got my stuff on that screen yet, so I don't have a clock. I have no way of knowing what time it is, so um, when you all start passing out, I'll know it's time to wind this message down. All right, let's ask a question. Question out of the gate. Who really understands me? Let's pray. Father, we, was, we just want to come and we just want to say thank you again for letting us come back together, giving us this, this chance. We've missed this. And Father, it's so good to see people filing back into your house. They've come to worship, to be with brothers and sisters in Christ, to celebrate being together. Father, I pray that, that that feeling and that experience never grows old, but that we always, always celebrate the fact that we can come together all with a common understanding, and that is who you are and what you've done for us by making us your brothers and sisters, making us brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, we are so thankful for that. Father, this morning, help me to communicate this message. This is an important message this morning. And I pray that I not get in the way at all, that I not mess this up, but you speak through me and to me. And I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Have you ever, uh, ever received any news that you just simply couldn't believe? It, it just took your breath away from you, maybe. It, 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 it caused you to step back and, and, and question things. Or it made you angry when you heard that news. It, it was news that it just didn't make any sense. It, it didn't, when you first saw it, it was like, there's no way this can, this can be real, that this can be true. We're going to talk about Peter this morning because he was told something that I just don't think he could comprehend. He couldn't understand or get his mind around. The story we've, we're going to look at this morning begins in Matthew chapter 16. Let's pick it up in verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed Raised on the third day. Now, let's just stop right there for a moment and look at that. How many times have, has somebody said something to you, but you only heard part of it, and you reacted to that part that you heard? Has anybody ever, I mean, how many times has somebody walked up and says, I've got good news and bad news? Dave gave me that news this week when he borrowed my truck. Good news and bad news. Good news is I didn't wreck your truck. Bad news is it's got different paint colors on it now than it had before. What do I hear? I don't hear the good news. I hear what? The bad news. And here's where Peter was at. When Jesus, he began to tell them, guys, we got to go to Jerusalem. And when we go, I'm going to suffer many things and I'm going to be killed. That's where his hearing stopped. And yet Jesus went on to say, but I will be raised again on the third day. Well, verse 22 tells us what Peter's reaction was to that. And look what he does here. It says, Peter took him aside and he began to, what? Rebuke the Lord. He began to tell the Lord, you don't know what you're talking about. You've got this thing wrong. He says, God forbid it, Lord that this should ever happen to you. But Jesus turned and he said to Peter, this is kind of hurtful. This is what Diana says to me sometimes. Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. For you're not setting your mind on God's interest, but on God, on, on man's. What a horrible thing to say to a man who had just earlier been the one who identified him as the son of God. A man who simply wanted to show his loyalty to him, to wanted him to understand, 
I will fight for you. I will do whatever it takes to protect you and keep this from happening to you. God forbid that this could happen. Peter was guilty of something that you and I are also guilty of most of the time. It's on your outline, guys. We often see and interpret everything according to our human reasoning. In other words, our flesh. A lot of people, I talk about walking in the flesh, walking in the spirit. I talk about our flesh being our biggest enemy. And stuff. And a lot of times people come to me and say, okay, I don't understand what you mean when you talk about the flesh. This is what I'm talking about. How we think, how we process information, how we react to things, where our loyalty lies, and that is in ourselves, me first, and everybody else can fall in suit. Peter heard and interpreted what Jesus said, and he heard it through the filter of his own human capacity, his own human reasoning. Romans 8 chapter 5 or verse 5 says for those who live according to the flesh what do they do they set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit they set their minds on what the things of God the things of the spirit they they learn how to process information through the holy spirit as he teaches as he he is instructed rather than how they would react out of their own flesh. Well, at this point in time in Peter's life, he was still very much walking in the flesh. He understood and he processed everything according to how it should be or how it would affect him. Now, Jesus knew that Satan wanted to blind Peter. He, to, to the truth. He knew that, that Satan wanted to trip Peter up and, and, and to get him to act out in his flesh. And, and Jesus knew it would be easy to do that because that's how Peter reacted to everything. You make me mad, I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to get even. You tell me something, I'm going to process it in a manner in which do I benefit from it or is it going to cause me difficulty? You see, everything Peter was, was processing or all the information that Peter was processing was based on his own human reasoning, his own understanding. And, say, and, and, and Jesus knew that. Many Christians, we do the same thing. And the reason is, is because we lack maturity. Now, I'm not saying that to be insultive because maybe you don't understand. I know a lot of times I'm teaching in a class and I will bring something to the table and somebody will question that and you can see it in their face, you can see it or hear it in their tone. They don't agree. They don't, they don't buy into that. And, and now that you've, you've just challenged them in a way that in the flesh they're really struggling with this because they want to justify how they think. They want to justify their reactions to things and how they feel about certain things. And so you start to see this war go on in the flesh, between the flesh and the spirit. And what they're seeing in scripture, what they're hearing me teach, but yet it's not comfortable. I don't like it. Are you sure you're right, preacher? I don't believe that. And I never get angry about that, and I never challenge about that, but I will push because I know, and here's where Jesus was with Peter. He knew Peter was reacting in the flesh, and he wanted Peter to stop thinking that way and start living and, li and thinking in the spirit according to what God is doing. And I got to tell you, and you probably already know this if you're a Christian, God does not always do things the way we want him to do things, amen? Amen. He does not always take us down paths we want to go, right? And so what happens is what he's doing is he is lovingly trying to reshape us, trying to, rethink, to get us to rethink how we, we, we process stuff because he wants us to stop processing it with human reasoning but according to spirit. Now here's a truth that's on your outline, and I want you guys to look at this. Satan couldn't win with Peter. And here's why. Satan could not stop the event of the cross. He knew he couldn't stop that. 
So what does he do? He works to block the message of the cross. Remember what Paul said to the Corinthian church there in his first letter to the, to the Corinthians in chapter 1, verse 18. He said, for the word of the cross is what? It's foolishness. To who? Those who are perishing, those who are processing everything in the flesh or living according to their own human reasoning and spirit. But to us who are being saved, the message of the cross makes all the sense in the world. We understand it and we embrace it because we know that if it were not for the cross, we would have no hope. Death would overtake us. But because of the cross, we don't fear death. We don't worry about that. We don't, we don't concern ourselves with all of the fear-mongering that is around us, filling our heads with noise and chaos all of the time. Because we know Christ has, won, has had victory over the, over the grave. Now, as if this isn't difficult news to accept that Jesus is going to be suffer he's going to suffer at the hands of the religious folk and then he's going to be killed by the religious folk if that's not bad enough he keeps going let's pick it up again and or let's pick it up in verse 24 Jesus said to his disciples if anyone wishes to come after me he also must deny himself take up his cross and follow me and then he says something that's just just absolutely ludicrous according to human thinking. And that is, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That's silly talk. There's nothing about that that makes any sense. Not according to human reasoning. You see, we're created to survive. We're created to protect ourselves. Our first instinct is to is to protect ourselves in a bad situation. Our first instinct is to take care of number one first and make sure we got what we need. But Jesus says anyone who thinks like that will end up losing. But anyone who is willing to lose their life ends up getting it. I can get you a rope and a lasso if you want one because she's faster than you are, Jamie. I want to speak to you husbands and wives right now. If you could learn this, if you could get this message in your marriages, you would see your relationship with your spouse explode. Not in a bad way, in a good way. Somebody said, oh, I've already experienced the explosion. That's not the one I'm talking about. You see, when you lose yourself, you surrender yourself and become entirely vulnerable to your spouse, you just open the door for God to do some amazing things. Unbelievable things. And here's what's really cool. When the husband and the wife get that figured out and they start doing it, Katie, bar the door. God will pour the flood, the, he'll open the floodgates of heaven into your life and into your family like you can't even begin to imagine. See, this principle is true on so many levels, in so many different areas of our life, in regards to our friendships with one another. In regards to our relationships with our siblings and our family. That's right, Kobe. Listen to me. When you lose your life on behalf of someone else, it's amazing what God is able to do in and through you. And I know that's hard. That is very, very painful to do sometimes because it puts you at risk. It makes you vulnerable to more pain and more hurt. But that's where the getting gets good. It's when you can learn to do that. And this is what Jesus is trying to get them to understand. When you can give your life up for my sake, oh, what God is going to do. This morning I sat on the front porch and I was, I was reading uh, out, of, out of the Gospel of Mark. And I was looking at some things where Peter and the apostles said, Lord, we've given everything up to follow you. And he said, and I know that. And some will receive 30-fold, some 60, some 100. Not only in the life to come, but even in this life. You see, Jesus continually taught this principle all throughout his teaching. 
when you surrender and give your life up for others, God, God, maybe not them, but God can pour into your life those blessings that you are cheating yourself of. And it may be painful for you at times. But God is faithful. We've been singing about that all morning, haven't we? Jesus also speaks of something here that is the catalyst to everything that he is desiring of you and me. Do you see what it is? It's love. It's love. You see, Paul also talked about that. He said, if I can do this, that, and the other thing, but I have not love, what difference does it make? Because he said the greatest of all things is love. It's love. I'm so excited, I'm shaking, I can't hardly even touch the thing because I'm actually looking at people right now. Love opens up the door to maturity in faith. Helps us to be able to see truth when we've been blinded to it. Look at your outline, guys. Maturity, maturity will never happen. This is a key point In this message today, guys, maturity will never happen in the life of a Christian until we learn to love Jesus more than ourselves. This morning I was reading about the rich young ruler. He came to the Lord and he said, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What's interesting in that story is that Jesus identifies some of the commandments, the Ten Commandments, but he starts in the middle. He didn't start at the beginning. You don't kill, you don't commit adultery, you don't steal, you don't do these things. And the response of the rich young ruler was this. I've done all those things. What's interesting, oftentimes in in Jesus' teaching is not necessarily what he says, but what he doesn't say. He didn't start with number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Jesus went right to the heart of the matter in, in regards to the rich young ruler. He said, I've done all these things. He said, no, you still lack one. What was it that Jesus said that he lacked? You got to get this God out of your life. Isn't that what he said? It's exactly what he said. Go sell all you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. See, Jesus went right to the heart of the matter. You got a God in your life. And until that God is removed from the throne, God can never be on the throne. You see, until you and I learn to love Jesus more than ourselves, we cannot mature in our faith. We will always remain at a child mentality level of faith because you will always be battling for that position of the throne. This was what Eve did. Eve didn't want to know what God knew. She didn't want to understand things like God. She wanted to be her own God. Therein was the problem. That's what the whole fall was about. She wanted to be God. Maturity cannot happen until we get down and let him get up. And we love him more than us. Well, he goes on, Jesus goes on talking about a recompense that's going to take place when he returns for those that he truly loves. Do you know that in the New Testament alone there are 320 references to the coming of Jesus? And rarely do you hear anybody preach about it anymore. In Beth, going on in verse 28 here, Matthew 16, he says something really interesting. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom, until they see the Son of Man coming in, in his kingdom. kingdom. You ever wonder what that means? Oh, they put a clock on the wall back there for me. You dirty bastard. I'm going to fire every day I Someone lead us in prayer. I'm sitting right now, so we need to go home. Oh, boy. I don't even know where I was. I'm just scrolling. 
Okay, here we go. Have you ever wondered what this meant, that some of you standing right here will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom? You know who he was talking to? Peter, James, and John. Verse 1, chapter 17, six days later. See, verse 28 is not supposed to be in chapter 16. Verse 28 is supposed to be in chapter 17. That's why you see it on the screen like you do. He was setting them up. He was telling them you're going to see something. You're going to experience something. And it's something you're going to need. This is an interesting story. We have an account of an event, not a parable, not a teaching. We have an event that's recorded in Scripture. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. So wake up, pay attention. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. Behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, is it, it, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make you three tabernacles, three booths. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. The disciples heard this. They fell face down to the ground. They were terrified. But Jesus came to them. He touched them, and he said, Get up and don't be afraid. Lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. When they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell this vision to nobody until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Don't tell anyone. This story is called the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, some of you may be familiar with it. Maybe this is the first time some of you have ever seen it. But what I want you to understand about this story of all the things that Jesus did that weren't recorded in the Scripture, and there were several things, the Bible tells us that he, they just did not, we, they weren't able to because he was so busy and he did so many things. But this story was preserved. You've got to wonder, I'm always asking questions of the Bible, why this story? Why was this one preserved when there were others that didn't make it into Scripture or, or, or weren't preserved by, by the Holy Spirit for us to have? Why this story? Because it's not a message. And it's not a parable. So therefore, you would assume there's no lesson to learn here. It's just a historical account. It's just a story about something that happened. Or is it? Is there something here that we never look at? Sometimes when you ask questions of the text, the Holy Spirit begins to open your mind and your eyes to things you've never noticed before. I want to pose two questions. Number one, why did Jesus need to see Moses and Elijah? It's on your outline, guys, these questions. Number two, who would benefit from this meeting? We're going to answer the second question first, and then I'm going to jump back to the, to, the, to, the second, or to the first question. I believe it was for Jesus' benefit. I believe the meeting was entirely for Jesus' benefit. But the lesson that comes out of it would also benefit Peter, James and John, I almost said Paul and Mary, boy, that would have been stupid. Peter, James, and John, I don't think Paul and Mary ever paid attention. And also for you and I, 2,000 years later, because there is nothing in the Word of God that does not have an impactful meaning and purpose for you and I. It is the Word of God written to you and I. So we got to ask questions. Why is the story in there? Jesus needed these three apostles to witness this event in order to bolster their faith 
because of things that were going to happen that they obviously could not understand and get their minds around. And to help them to understand the purpose for his coming. But to answer the first question, Jesus needed this event to take place because I believe he needed something from these two men. There was something that only Moses and Elijah could do for him. And you're thinking, this is Jesus. Why would he need them? He had everything. Here's the thing that I struggle with more than anything in my theology. It's not the virgin birth. It's not the Trinity. For whatever reason, I can believe those and accept those by faith very easily. Even though I can't explain them, I can receive them and I understand them. Here's what I struggle with in my theology. God in the flesh as a human being. That has always baffled me. It has always been something that I've struggled to get my mind around because Jesus needed nothing. And yet, if we truly believe that Jesus was human, that tells us Jesus did need something. No different than you and I. Stay on track with me. Let's keep this moving. Jesus, the Son of God, the creator of all things, became a human being like me and like you. Omnipotence, omniscience, held captive by flesh and bone and blood. See, by faith, I fully believe that Jesus is the Son of God. By faith, I fully believe that Jesus was God in flesh. But my mind struggles to understand that and to accept it. You see, my human mind struggles to think that the creator of all things, everything that we see, was a human being and yet was capable of living in this flesh sinless. That's amazing to me. That's absolutely amazing to me. And here's what my concern is, is I am afraid most Christians never give much thought to that. They never consider the, the captivity that Jesus placed himself in, the danger that God put himself in by clothing himself in the flesh. They never see the risk. They never understand the magnitude of that. That is the most amazing thing in all of the scripture, in all of the universe. It's not the creation of the world. It's not the creation of you and me. It's the idea that God became us, just like us, 100% human, and he never sinned. That's more than my mind can understand and embrace. Because it's the deepest idea of theology there is. So how did I come to accept this amazing truth? It's on your outline. I, I began to learn and understand something. For me to be free from the condemnation of my sin and the penalty of death that I'm subject to, Jesus had to come where I am and become like me. Here's how this works. If I'm going to rescue someone from impending death, I got to go where they are. You see, if somebody's trapped in a car, and that car's on fire. If I'm going to rescue them, you know what I have to do? I got to get in that car to help free them and get them out. If a house is on fire and they've been overcome with smoke inhalation and they are passed out, if I'm going to rescue them, I have to put myself in danger. I put myself at risk and I've got to get in that house and find them and seek them out and drag them and pull them out of that 
to rescue them. If somebody is drowning, I have to get in to get them out. I don't know if Mary knows this. My sister-in-law is sitting here. Her oldest son, Marlon, was saining with me the week I got married. And he stepped off a ledge in a pond with a long sleeve shirt on and it would unbutton and come down. He went down. I saw him come back up again and I thought, he just stepped off in something. And then he went down again. He didn't come up. And I, I, just, I was still in the water, but I jumped in and I swam to him. And I, he was under the water. And I went down and I hit him in his hips with my head and grabbed him and just took off and went to the top. There was another guy with us that had seen the same thing and swam and grabbed a hold to him and we rolled him over and we swam him out of that pond. And he threw up a gallon of water on the side of that palm bank that day. The only way he wouldn't have drowned that day is the two of us had to go put ourselves in danger. We had to get in there with him in his mess the trouble that he was in, we had to engage in that trouble to get him out of that pond. Jesus could not save us if he did not get in the mess with us. And he had to be just like us in order to pull this off. Hebrews 2, 14 to 18 tells us this. It says, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood. He himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but look at this, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Now we're going to come back to that. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. Don't miss that. If you got your Bibles open, you want to underline that or highlight that. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. Why? So that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to do what? Make propitiation, to appease for our sins, the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted... Isn't that hard to get your mind around? Jesus tempted? Jesus struggling with the pressures and the stress and the temptations of life? Because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are also being tempted. Jump two chapters to chapter 4, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we, here it is again, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet with no sin. He has, ex he has experienced everything we have, and yet he has done it perfectly, never once yielded to sin. Therefore, here's the benefit. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When I read this, I realize that he suffered with temptation and trials just like me because of his humanity. Now, although my mind and my heart may not always be trustworthy, I know that God's word is trustworthy. So though I may struggle to understand God in the flesh, experiencing the same frustration and, and difficulties and weariness and, and fatigue and all of the things that drive me out of my mind and cause, often cause me to sin, Jesus experienced those very same things and yet he never sinned. I choose to trust God's word on this. Therefore, here's what I know on your outline. Jesus, the Son of God, became man in complete human form. And because of his humanity, Jesus found himself. Now we're getting back to the Mount of Transfiguration because you all wonder why I was chasing that rabbit down the road. I wasn't chasing a rabbit. 
I'm trying to get you back to the Mount of Transfiguration. It just took me a little while to get you there. Because of Jesus' humanity, Jesus found himself needing encouragement and rest just like we do. And who did he go to? Two men of kindred spirits. Now, some would think, okay, you sit here telling me that Jesus struggled with the weakness of his flesh. I have a hard time dealing with that. And so you might ask this question, doesn't that portray Jesus as being weak in some way? No. When I began to really understand this, it causes me to admire him. It raises my level of admiration for him. To think that he too suffers as I do in the difficulties and frustrations and the depressions of life and everything else that goes on. And yet he was able to overcome those things and deal with those things perfectly. That encourages me because now I know I have a high priest who can what? Sympathize with me though I fail. He still understands though he never did fail. Now, who are the true descendants of Abraham that are going to gain the benefit of this? Well, Galatians 3, chapter 3, verses 6 through 9 says, Even though so Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, therefore be sure that it is those who are of the faith who are sons of Abraham. Look at that. Who's going to benefit from a high priest who can sympathize with their weaknesses, the descendants of Abraham. You say, well, we're not Jewish. Verse 8, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Now, we are Gentile. And the Bible tells us that true descendants of Abraham are not those who are only of Jewish blood, but also those who are of the same faith that was credited to Abraham as righteousness. You and I alike. Zechariah chapter 8 talks about the ten, 10 men, Gentiles, who will grab the hem of a garment of a Jew in the latter days and say unto them, Let us go into the house of the Lord, for the favor of the Lord rests upon you. You see, the Bible constantly is teaching of a marriage between Jews and Gentiles alike where we will be one in Christ. The humanity of Jesus took its toll on him at times, and it brought about suffering. And just like us, he was under the same restrictions of the human body in a human environment. Yes, it's true, Jesus dealt with stupid people as well. He understands that. He understands how, to, how the frustrations of life and the weariness of the body and the and the. And the, 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 the ailments and the aches and the pains that a person experiences can become very overwhelming at times. And he took time to get away and be with the Father and spend time in prayer to rest his body. He was asleep in a boat in the middle of a storm. You don't think the guy was wore out to be able to do that when everybody else was freaking out and, and panicking? And he's sound asleep because he was wore out. Why? Because of the human body. Knowing that, it makes sense that Jesus needed some encouragement. He needed some ministry. This is why that no matter what we go through, you and I have the assurance that no matter how bad it is, how hard it is, how difficult it is, Jesus understands. Jesus understands. He doesn't criticize. He doesn't condemn you for how you're feeling and what you're, what you're dealing with. He understands. He, Hebrews tells us, sympathizes. Jesus knew that his time was closing in to die. He knew that, 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 that things were becoming more and more intense and he needed a meeting. Well, Peter's not the one that Jesus attacks here in his remarks. Get behind me, Satan. Jesus was hearing a voice he had heard before. Do you remember when Jesus was baptized and he went out into the wilderness for 40 days and Satan was there the whole time and he was tempting him? He was in his head. He was talking to him all of the time. What was, what was Satan appealing to? The Son of God? No. 
Was he appealing to the deity of Christ? No. Satan was appealing to the humanity of Christ. You hungry? Make a, turn the stone into bread and eat it. You're going to die if you stay on this mission. You know what they're going to do to you? Just worship me. I'll turn the kingdoms back over to you. I'll release this world back to you. What was Satan appealing to? The humanity of Christ. Because he knew he, couldn't, he could not appeal to the divinity of Christ. Do you understand how much Jesus suffered in human flesh long before the, the beatings, the trials, and the, the crucifixion? The crucifixion and the beatings lasted about 12 hours. He struggled and suffered in the humanity and the flesh and, and bone for 33 years. Being held captive, imprisoned by his own flesh. Why these two men? Why Moses? It's on your outline. Moses was a lawgiver. Moses gave us the law. He gave us the commandments that taught us we're sinners. Paul said, hey, before, before the law came, I know I was a sinner. That's when I read the law, I realized, whoa, I got some issues. Why Elijah? Elijah represents, he is the epitome of all prophets. Because the prophets kept talking about a coming Messiah, Hamashiach. One who would come and, and, and bring about a kingdom and a restoration and a delivery. All of the prophets throughout the Old Testament spoke of the Messiah. And he represents them. On your outline, guys, Jesus in his humanity would be now the fulfillment. Here's the trio. This is why this trio is so important. Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. Moses bringing the law, Elijah being the father of the prophets, prophesying the coming kingdom of Jesus, Jesus was the fulfillment of that. Look at that. Jesus in his humanity would be the fulfillment of all that God had done through these two men prior to his coming. The stage has been set for Jesus' coming. Jesus must now finish it. Everything has been put in motion. Everything is moving in the way that God wants it to be. Moses has done his part. Elijah and his prophets have done their part. But if Jesus doesn't complete it, it will all be for naught. But how does he complete it? He's got to complete it in human form. He can't come as God. He's got to come as man. And he has to finish this thing. He's got to tie it up. These men were kindred spirits with Jesus. Look at your outline, guys. You see, Moses and Elijah, both of these men had seen their own wilderness. Both of these men had experienced rejection by their own people. And both of these men had faced temptation in some very trying times. All the things that Jesus would deal with in his humanity. God had used these men to set the stage for his ultimate plan. That his son in human form would bring to completion. How many of you recall three words that Jesus spoke just before he died. Anybody remember them? It's finished. You know what he's talking about? I've done it. I've accomplished this in my body, in the flesh. It's finished. And the Bible says he breathed his last breath and he gave up the ghost and he died. Jesus completed the purpose that had been pioneered by Moses and Elijah. 
it only makes sense, guys, that he would need to meet with them prior to the final chapter of his humanity. But Satan would be there at every turn, tempting him. Tempting him in his flesh. Appealing to his humanity. You're tired. You're hungry. They're not listening to you. They don't get what you're saying. They don't understand. You're not effective. Satan was constantly appealing to his human mind. Constantly attacking him in that area. Some of you here this morning, you've sat here and you've said, all right, cool story. We have had our knowledge increased. But what's this have to do with me? It's in your takeaway. Ten minutes to twelve o'clock. And I thought I'd only come back. Here's what it has to do with you guys, and it has to do with me. And here's where we ought to have peace. This is where we need to get to a place of maturity in our faith that we start to experience the peace that God wants us to have in our relationship with him. Here it is. We have the assurance. How many of you remember the old song, Blessed Assurance? Oh, my gosh. That's one of my favorite hymns in all of the Bible, Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine because he understands. He knows how hard it is to overcome this flesh and to battle it and to have the noise and the chaos of the world in our head all of the time. We have the assurance of knowing that Jesus can sympathize with us in any situation of life because he faced this world as a human being just like us and he won the victory for us. Where's my Pentecostal voices at that were scattered out through the congregation? There we go. I knew you were there. Some of you are looking for a victory in your life. Some of you want to mature in your faith. Some of you want to find that peace, to experience that peace that passeth all understanding. But it will not come without challenge. It will not come without you doing the work of understanding that God has to work in and through your life and he's got to take you down paths you don't want to go. He's got to put you in situations you don't want to be in order for you to learn to have victory. It isn't just given out. You've got to cultivate that relationship. I don't know if anybody's following the coffee with a pastor or not in the mornings, but that's been the theme of just about every one of them, and it's cultivating the relationship. But a part of cultivating the relationship is doing battle in the flesh or against the flesh, not with the flesh, but against the flesh, and, and, and learning to walk in the Spirit and letting God do what he wants to do in your life. And you beat that flesh down. What was it that Paul said? That I take captive what? Every thought that does what? Stands in opposition to anything that God wants me to know. And I do what? I beat it into obedience. I put it where it belongs. And I'm able to do that. And I'm able to, to approach the throne of grace with confidence. Why? Because I know I have a high priest that understands and he knows this is hard. This life is hard. And my flesh is strong in wanting to hurt and defeat me and destroy me. Satan, he is that thief that wants to come and steal and kill and destroy. Please understand, God is not mad at you. 
because of the failures you've experienced in your life. He is not mad at you because you've made some bonehead decisions that's got you in trouble, that's costing you even today, and you're dealing with the consequences of that. He is not mad. He is not upset. He is not criticizing you. He is not condemning you. There is now therefore no condemnation in you. Those who are in Christ Jesus. What does it take for you to understand we have a high priest who sympathizes with our struggle in this life? Some of you have been scared out of your mind over the coronavirus. Some of you have been scared out of your mind over your businesses. Be wondering, those of you who are in small businesses, are you going to lose them or not? Some of you have been scared out of your mind because of your job situation and the unemployment and what's going on and how long can the government continue to sustain some of these things that they're trying to do. Some of you have been worried to, to death. Some, there are people that aren't here this morning because they are still being held in captive to the fear of their humanity. God knows, and he understands, and he sympathizes with that. Some of you are so beat up. Some of you are so weary. Some of you are so tired that you think, I can't keep doing this. You ever said that? I can't keep doing this. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. But you cannot do it in your flesh. But you can do it in the spirit of God. You can do it through the strength and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit working in and through you, but you've got to get humble before the Lord, and you've got to say, I will do and go and be whatever you ask. And when I fail, correct me. But know this, even when he corrects, he never does it in anger. Thank God that we have a Savior that sympathizes with our weaknesses. Don't beat yourself up. Satan's got a full crew doing that for you. Don't do it to yourself. Humble yourself before the Lord and let him embrace you and watch what he does in and through your life. Maybe some of you need to go take a walk on the mountain and meet with Jesus because you're whooped, you're wore out, you're exhausted, and you don't know what else to do. Go take a walk on the mountain with one who understands. Amen? Let's pray. Father. Man, it's good to be back. Thank you for letting me do what you have asked me to do. I pray I've not messed this up. I pray that I've not gotten away in the way at all. But I pray that, Father, it has done exactly what you wanted it to do in the hearts of your people this morning. We will not walk in fear. And we are not going to succumb to our flesh because we know that you love us and you will not give up on us and you will continue to walk with us. Keep us close to you. And as children stray, gather us up and draw us back in. And use us however you want. Do with us whatever you desire. I pray this in your name, Jesus.